Good afternoon and welcome to the 2022 National Ryan White Conference on HIV Care and Treatment Session 20794, Transforming the Capacity Builders. My name is Katisha Mosley and I am a public health advisor within HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau's Division of Community HIV AIDS Program and I will be serving as your moderator today. We thank you for joining today's session. As you participate in the session, please feel free to add your questions or comments in the chat box. At the conclusion of the session, the presenters will have the opportunity to address your questions. Let's begin. Greetings and welcome to our presentation on Transforming the Capacity Builders. My name is Adam Thompson and I'm joined by two of my colleagues, Susan Weigel and Raina Appenzeller. We have no relevant disclosures other than myself, uh, who would like to disclose that I am a member of the Board of Directors for the National Quality Forum engaged in measure development. To begin off our presentation uh, will be myself and my colleague, Susan Weigel. Uh, the two of us serve as the Northeast Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center Regional Resource Coaches. As Regional Resource Coaches, our role is to support our Ryan White AETC local performance sites, which we call Regional Partners, in implementing their practice transformation projects, which is part of the portfolio of services offered by the AIDS Education and Training Centers nationally. Susan and I, uh, I used to run a regional partner myself, and Susan has extensive experience in organizational and clinical quality management. And the two of us set about to create a model of practice transformation that would be feasible in our AIDS education and training centers. And hopefully, uh, as we will see through our presentation today, a replicable and scalable model as well that we could offer our AETC partners nationally. Our objectives for today are to discuss the replicable and scalable model for practice transformation, which we call leveraging evidence to address disparities or the LEAD project. We'd like to review the key components of our interactive virtual training that we designed for practice transformation coaches, as well as review a few of the tools that we developed for our practice transformation activities. Lastly, we'll discuss a couple of engagement strategies that we've developed as well as some of, the, some of the stories and experiences of our Ryan White partners in their efforts to affect change in local HIV programs, such as federally qualified healthcare centers and other clinical and non-clinical sites. So our story really begins with a mission to address a longstanding problem in healthcare. Some of you may be familiar with the concept of the evidence to practice or research to practice gap, which reflects the amount of time it generally takes for information to be proven in something like a randomized control trial, and then the amount of time it takes before that thing that we know, that evidence-based practice, is both adopted as a guideline and then finally implemented with some fidelity. This is a study showing some pretty common screenings that we do across the country and how long it took from the time we knew that we should be doing that evidence-based screening to the time it took for 50% of the population to experience that, that expected outcome of having this screening. You can see here that the average uh, evidence to practice gap uh, in this study showed to be about 15 years, meaning that it's taking 15 years from the time we know that something is effective to the time most of us are doing that effective practice. As the AIDS Education and Training Center, we're tasked to support uh, HIV services providers funded through the Ryan White Program in providing high quality services to persons at risk for and living with HIV. As part of our efforts to do that, we attend to the systems that support and deliver those services. Our goal through the Practice Transformation Project has long been to address this evidence to practice gap by ensuring that we're bringing evidence-based practices, emergence emerging strategies and evidence-informed interventions to our clinics and organizations and supporting them in the adoption and implementation of those practices. The way we go about doing this is a combination of both improvement and implementation science. Improvement-based practices are something that the AIDS Education and Training Centers as clinical powerhouses have been involved in with a long, for a long time, as well as Ryan White programs supported through our Center for Quality Improvement and Innovation. However, implementation science is sort of a 
newer concept uh, for some of our partners. And so we feel that it's important uh, as part of our projects to include not only improvement pathways, but understandings of how you adopt and adapt evidence-based practices. Because implementation science was invented to actually identify generalizable findings that we are seeing in our research settings so that we can promote that uptake of those findings much faster and adopt them into practice so that we reduce the amount of time it takes between knowing something and doing something broadly. When we go in to talk to our site, one of the things that's critical for us to know is what are we trying to do? Uh, the first question in the model for improvement is what are you trying to accomplish? And so as coaches and regional resource coaches, we support our sites in trying to understand, are they trying to do the right thing? which would really be the orientation of implementation science, which would focus on the implementation of, of evidence-based practices? Or are they concerned about doing things right, which is more the orientation of quality improvement, making sure that evidence-based practices that are already existent in the environment are done thoroughly, efficiently, and reliably. By determining the appropriate pathway, we're able to implement our model to help individuals and clinics implement an evidence-based practice or improve an already existing practice. The important thing to know and where we guide our projects is that improvement projects usually begin with a specific problem requiring investigation and further understanding, whereas implementation projects usually begin with an evidence-based practice and then you seek to adapt uh, that practice into the environment, paying close attention to the context and the constraints of the specific healthcare setting. So our project, Leveraging Evidence to Address Disparities, or LEAD, was a practice transformation model that we developed that would be able to take advantage of both implementation and improvement pathways. The purpose of our project was to leverage evidence and best practice from Ryan White HIV AIDS programs to inform and improve efforts to end the HIV epidemic in our local community. Our LEAD process consists of four primary phases. The first phase is choose an area of focus. The second phase, selecting an outcome of interest. The third phase, implementing your intervention. And the fourth phase of sustaining your outcomes. We established a 12 month timeline that would allow our sites to better understand the context of their environment prior to improvement or implementation. And then established a six month timeline to allow them to implement that new practice while maintaining our performance monitoring that we had developed during our project with a check-in around month nine, and then lastly, a closeout at month 12 to evaluate whether the project was effective at improving uh, on a performance indicator or effective at ad adapting and adopting a new evidence-based practice into the environment. We begin by choosing an area of focus. During the agency onboarding, our leadership meets with the agency leadership to sign the agency AETC letter of agreement, which details the expectations both for our practice transformation site, as well as for the regional partner, for our local performance site, and our central office. We review the agency assessment tools that are provided by our JSI partners and are part of our national evaluation for the project. We identify the agency team leader or project champion, who will be our internal uh, sort of arms and representative for the project inside the organization as well as representing that organization outside of it to us as part of the lead project. And then we ask folks to select an area of focus in one of three areas, screening and assessment, linkage, or engagement. We approach our project with a status neutral continuum, recognizing that ending the HIV epidemic happens by paying attention to all folks in our communities, uh, that includes individuals at risk for HIV who could benefit from referral and linkage and support in PrEP services or individuals who test positive or screen positive for HIV who could benefit from rapid linkage to treatment and care, as well as support to sustain themselves in care and achieve viral load suppression. Some examples of areas of focus in addition to our care continuum include areas in screening and assessment beyond HIV, such as STI screening, behavioral health screening, including mental health and substance use disorders, and oral health primary care screening and assessment. In our linkage to care category, folks can discuss or improve linkage to PrEP or linkage to primary HIV care, including behavioral health or oral health services. Engagement to care can include projects such as retention in primary HIV care or PrEP services, as well as MAT, 
or simply focusing a project on improving or adopting a new practice to support individuals towards a higher viral load suppression rate in the clinic and population. Once an individual or organization has selected their area of focus, we then ask them to think more deeply about the area to define and select their outcome of interest, which will be the measure that is used to monitor and then sustain their project. Leveraging routinely reported process measures, we ask folks to think about what specific aspect of your area of focus are you seeking to improve or where will the evidence-based practice have the most effect? For example, individuals choosing screening and testing may be particularly interested in measuring the percentage of their newly diagnosed patients who are linked to care within 30 days or a positivity rate for their HIV screening and testing program. Another clinic may be interested in engagement to care, but specifically looking at patient retention in PrEP and measuring adherence to expected medical visits over a period of time. Other clinics may be interested in STI screening rates, or an organization may choose to aim their project or their implementation around a viral load suppression improvement. When we sit down to plan with our organizations, we walk them through three large meetings. The first meeting is intended to set the aim, where we conduct an organizational situation analysis, looking at their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, as well as the development of an aim statement, which is facilitated by the practice facilitator assigned to the site from the AETC. Our second meeting examines their current workflows and looks at any barriers or facilitators that exist in the environment around the intervention or the improvement and then selecting the intervention based on our understanding of the problem and the context and the goals and outcomes that the clinic would like to have. Our third meeting is focused on developing the tailored agency implementation plan, which will detail the steps that the AETC and the clinic will go through to plan or better understand an improvement opportunity or an implementation uh, engagement around bringing in an evidence-based practice. So when we go to implement changes, our implementation includes beginning with the selection of the evidence-based, evidence-informed intervention or emerging strategy. Once they've identified one of those, or an idea or an opportunity or a tool or a resource from one of those three areas, we develop or we adapt an implementation plan depending on the resources available. And then our third step moves to implementing the intervention. As mentioned, we ask that our sites select interventions that have a certain level of evidence or data behind them, and we utilize HRSA's implementation science framework as our guide, which identifies emerging strategies, evidence-informed interventions, and evidence-based interventions. In particular, we draw our sites' uh, attention to the category of emerging strategies, and emerging strategies are those practices where real-world validity and effectiveness have been demonstrated, but these strategies don't yet actually have a sufficient published research evidence to call them evidence-informed or evidence-based. These emerging strategies are the best practices found in our Ryan White programs, as well as many of the initial findings of our special projects of national significance. After an organization has identified the intervention and have developed their tailored plan and have begun implementing the focus we begin to turn to is sustaining those outcomes, really identifying where have been the project successes and challenges, making adjustments to the plan or the goals or the indicators as needed, while always keeping our eyes on the final product we hope to hand over to the organization, which are finalized policies, procedures, and monitoring plans to support the long-term sustainability. During our 12-month evaluation meeting, we first and foremost celebrate the agency project. Uh, it is a lot of work these sites do, not only the AETC staff, but the clinics and organizations that have to implement all of the great ideas that they come up with. We support this celebration through the development of an agency project practice facilitator storyboard, helping to capture the successes of the organization over the 12-month period. And we do another review of our required agency assessment uh, to evaluate the project 12 months after initiation and there and moving forward annually for the duration of the grant or as long as the practice transformation site stays engaged. At the end of the 12 months, uh, our hope and goal is that our agencies are so excited by all the work that they've done that they ask us to stay on by identifying a new area of focus or an additional outcome of interest. Some sites have already indicated and have started working on continuations of existing projects, while other sites have chosen to shift their focus uh, celebrate the success of the previous project and begin looking at a different area of focus for their next cycle. 
So now what I would like to do uh, is hand it, oh wait, nope, I'm still me. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about agency support and the things that we put in place to support our site before I hand it off to my colleague, Susan, who will talk to us about our training and documentation. So two supports that we put in place for our sites uh, that I think are critical to understand the model. First is that we established a practice facilitation program. Uh, practice facilitation is itself a multi-component implementation strategy that is utilized to help practices uh, essentially improve their quality uh, and decrease these evidence to practice gaps that we have in our environment. Practice facilitators are individuals who are trained in practice facilitation. Uh, the AETCs invested in practice facilitator certification for many of our coaches. And so prior to the implementation of our model and our training, our coaches had uh, many of them uh, baseline uh, exposure to a certificate program for practice facilitation. The way that practice facilitators support agencies, either in an improvement or an implementation pathway, is by helping them tailor or adapt evidence-based practices or investigate and better understand their specific problem. Practice facilitators actually utilize a similar set of tools to better understand contextual factors. So whether an organization is trying to improve or trying to implement, uh, or whether they're trying to improve and then implement, uh, many of the tools and, and strategies that we use as coaches are the same, simply deployed in a different way uh, and utilized within the context of that particular type of project, which allowed us to build our training around a core set of tools that could be used regardless of which pathway an organization chose. The reason practice facilitators are important, and you've heard me mention already uh, several times, contextual factors. Uh, people in uh, healthcare are not in manufacturing warehouses. They do not manufacture patient products. Uh, patients have feelings and emotions and they do not like conveyor belts. Uh, as a person with HIV myself, I can speak to this from both perspectives. Um, we are unique and our systems uh, are run by our uniqueness. And in many ways that is a strength that allows us to tailor and adapt and change to really meet uh, everyone's unique needs but it also means that it can be very difficult sometimes to try to standardize or to try and translate a standard process into your specific environment. Contextual factors in healthcare include purposeful redundancies, multiple decision points, a heavy reliance on specific kinds of documentation and checklists, and policies and regulations, which dictate the kind of work we have to do, which applies constraints. Uh, much less the largest contextual factor, which is our patients, family, and caregivers, who at the end of the day have values and preferences that need to guide our choices. Practice facilitators help organizations understand these contextual factors, pay attention to them, and deploy tools and strategies to help them better understand and tailor their implementation around, uh, around them if they can't defeat them or how we reduce the barrier if possible. Most practice facilitators spend their time doing some pretty uh, basic activities, everything from doing tasks all the way up to coaching. Uh, a couple of tasks that I think are important to note, project management, uh, where we facilitate a lot, prepare a lot of agenda for sites. We facilitate process mapping instead of giving them instructions on how to do it. Uh, and that takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort in planning, but it yields uh, a big result at the end. We do some consulting, helping to build leadership buy-in and speaking to external partners to help get that uh, sort of deeper engagement, as well as our traditional AETC services of providing training and capacity building. Here are some definitions of practice facilitator activities that came from a study that was done uh, in the heartland here in the United States. So if you are more interested in learning about how practice facilitators define their tasks or activities, or better understand some of the roles that our practice facilitators take in our project, uh, this study uh, is a great place to start and really gives you a great overview of what these activities look like. The supports that our practice facilitators provide include the drafting and development of the tailored implementation plan. As mentioned, we facilitate agency meetings, uh, bringing to the table structured, scalable, and adaptable models of change. We will help draft their implementation materials and documents to help support uh, any fact sheets they may need. We provide meeting summaries and the development of synthesis reports from our discovery activities so that our clinics spend their time caring for patients and not documenting the meetings, which is something we are fully capable of doing. We do create storyboards to help them showcase uh, to their external stakeholders in both internal and external what they've been doing as well as helping them put together sort of uh, the project scope and everything they've done for staff so that we can have a process. Uh, we have a lot of folks who turn over in our environment. 
So our practice facilitators help address that. And we also make sure that we give them preferred access to all of our offerings, including any of our conferences. During implementation, uh, as I mentioned, we do provide a lot of just-in-time training. So if a staff uh, hits a wall where they need to understand something more deeply, we can drop in with didactic or interactive presentations or set them up for preceptorships to develop new skills or competencies, as well as providing our traditional uh, model of technical assistance, which can involve selection of interventions, practice tailoring, uh, adaptations, including the establishment of performance measurement strategies and workflows. We support them with our agency calls on a monthly basis. Uh, most of our teams have asked now to meet more than once. Uh, I think it's always a good sign when your client says we want more meetings, not less. Uh, so while we require a once a month meeting, our current practice now is more at two times a month uh, to keep the engagement of our sites, as well as our nine month project status update, which helps us keep focused on sustainability. Lastly, we bribe them. Just kidding, we don't bribe them. That is not what the government does. Uh, what we do is we offer them funding to make their change. Uh, it is very difficult to make change in environments and sometimes a little bit of money goes a long way. So for an annual project of a 12 month engagement, uh, we offer our sites up to $10,000 in project support. They fill out a funding tool that's aligned with their budget and work plan so we can see how the funds are directly supporting the outcome and also making sure that we're adhering to all of our internal AATC policies as well as the policies uh, of our past through funders as well. So now I will be passing it to my colleague, Susan Weigel, who's gonna to talk to us a little bit more about our practice facilitator training. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, so today I will briefly touch upon the training that we've structured and some of the tools that we've used with the understanding that Raina, my colleague, will talk about the application of these tools. Next slide. So just to be clear, we, we really started with the idea that um, part of the facil practice facilitator's role is to engage the Ryan White providers. Um, so we created a, a series of tools to help with that, including a PowerPoint presentation to explain exactly what the project was, to really have um, the providers who would engage with us understand what practice transformation was, and to understand how we would engage each site and what the benefits of participation would be. Next slide. Um, so in addition to the PowerPoint uh, for engagement, we made a nifty one pager that really talks more clearly about sort of each step in the process that we would take with a site that was working with us to um, implement improvement at their site. Next slide. Um, and this is a tool that we use, which is an adaptation of the JSI um, data measurement tool. Uh, what we found was that we needed to make these tools a little more user friendly for each of the providers and sites. And this is one way that we did that. Um, each practice facilitator is trained on how to uh, use this tool and the measures that are included in this tool. Next slide. <clears throat> So here we, here we go. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the training and capacity building. Um, originally, we had planned for an in-person training that was going to be held in 2020. Um, COVID had different plans for us, so we quickly pivoted and revised this training to what is now a virtual training, which is an eight-module um, package of trainings that includes both case study assignments um, to apply knowledge, skills, and tools from the training, um, the practice facilitators walk through the case study. In addition, they get homework where they take the tool and apply it in their local setting. Um, and we have a teach all, learn all model that we use. Um, so, so the practice facilitators are really learning from the application of the tool. Um, the ATC staff present the case study and the assignments at the beginning and at the next module. Um, topics include situational analysis, aim statement development, process and journey maps, um, cause and effect diagram, some work at, at ideation and prioritization, applying the model for improvement, uh, helping sites to uh, define and map out their measurement, documenting projects, um, and this uh, training was actually developed by Adam and myself who are the regional coaches. So now I'll touch upon some of the tools that I just referenced. Next slide. 
Um, so this is a tool that actually helps the practice facilitator understand sort of their, their process, really. Um, it maps out the key activities. Adam touched upon this briefly, but it really details out each step along the process, process of onboarding, orientation, and then implementation of the model that we are working with the sites on. Next slide. Uh, this, the situational analysis tool that we use is a SWOT analysis tool where we work with sites and the practice facilitators actually try out this tool to identify strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats within the local context. Um, the tool really helps to identify weaknesses from a place of how to direct your practice facilitation, capacity building to really um, look for the opportunities and those weaknesses um, and really look at leveraging where the strengths are in an organization. Next slide. In terms of the aim statement, we have a number of tools um, that we're training on and really working with sites to um, look at their data, look at their causal analysis and really set aims that are realistic, um, that are effective, that are hopefully timely, efficient, and equitable. Next slide. We also rely heavily on process mapping and patient journey mapping. This is really where we get to the details and really understand where the site is um, and really help teams to better understand where they have processes, um, but more importantly, where perhaps those processes are unclear, where, they may, where there may be gaps in their service delivery, um, and these tools really help to point us to the work in terms of identifying interventions to implement somewhere along the pathway of the processes that are in place. Um, clearly, the patient journey mapping is a tool where we learn more about the patient experience. Um, and for those sites that um, practice facilitators are working with, we have heard um, strong positive feedback that the patient journey mapping actually really helps to highlight where um, the most need is and where the priority is. And it gets the sites and the practice facilitator to really see the urgency behind some of the work that they're doing. Next slide. <clears throat> most of you are probably familiar with the cause and effect diagram. This is something that we work uh, with sites on to really identify the root cause of um, some of the problems that they're seeing at their agency and to really think through what those are. And as they think about change strategies or evidence-based interventions, they're really looking to target those root causes that they identify here. Next slide. Um, you know, clearly, as we work through the process mapping and um, causal analysis, ideas generate. Um, the practice facilitators are trained in how to, one, gather all those ideas from the teams that they're working with, um, but more importantly, how to start to prioritize those um, change strategies or, or um, interventions in a way that the site is really selecting and prioritizing uh, those ideas in a way that makes sense and is feasible in the local context. Next slide. Uh, we use the model for improvement. The practice facilitators are trained to use this. Um, it serves multiple purposes. As, as Adam mentioned in the beginning, there are two pathways we can take a site. One is down the improvement pathway. The other is selecting an intervention and implementing. The model for improvement can help in both respects in that as an intervention or a piece of an intervention is being tested, a, tested at a site, um, it can be adapted using the model for improvement. Um, and we just structure this work in a way that can meet both needs. Um, and the practice facilitators are pretty adept at this. Next slide. Measurement tree, um, that's uh, actually a very helpful tool that the practice facilitators use to uh, work with the sites to not only think about their leading outcomes, um, because you know pretty much most sites are thinking about the outcome, but to think about measures of the process that they're implementing um, to understand uh, what's working and what's not working with that implementation. 
but also the implementation process. So how are we um, measuring the actual implementation of the intervention on the ground and assuring that we are responding to the findings? Next slide. Uh, this is an example of an implementation plan. So every site um, gets an implementation plan developed with them, for them, by the practice facilitator. And that's just a simple example. Next slide. Other tools we use for documentation, which is key, you know, it's very hard sometimes, and this is one of probably a very common challenge that, that all of us have, is really documenting what we're doing and capturing that. Um, so we have activity reports for this. We use the implementation report. We work with sites to develop project charters so they themselves could demonstrate to their stakeholders the work that they're doing and the improvements that they're making. Um, and in addition, this is just an example of the budget and work plan. So like Adam said, we're not bribing people. Um, we're offering the $10,000 incentive, but with the understanding that they're developing a work plan and budget that is directly associated with this project. So it's really focused on implementation. It's really focused on the data involved in um, assessing progress. Um, so yeah, it's a way to sort of structure it so that it's it's not just, you know, here's a gift certificate or an incentive, but you know, here's a here's a nice little sum of money. How can we use it to support the implementation of this project? Next slide. So now I'm handing it back to my colleague Adam Thompson. Thank you so much, Susan, for walking us through our virtual training and all of our tools and resources. Uh, if anybody out there is interested, we are happy to share uh, any of those items. We've shared them with a couple of our other AETC partners, but anyone involved really in coaching and coordinating uh, sites around improvement or implementation may find some of them valuable. So uh, not only were we at AETC tasked to sort of you know, help bring about uh, more evidence and you know, more emerging strategies sort of into implementation in our systems. But we were also thinking about our own implementation and dissemination. Um, myself, I was a director of a local performance site. And so as I was tinkering with and kind of trying to figure out, I think like many of us were, what is practice transformation? How do we do this? How does this change our scope? Um, I connected uh, a lot with my other regional partner directors and had conversations with them to try to better understand what's going on in your space. What are you leveraging? What tools and resources are you finding valuable? And part of the reason that I do this, it's not just because I think it's a great idea for peer networking, but also because as a person who believes strongly in the national HIV AIDS strategy and how important it is to have stakeholders with a shared vision of where we're going, as the AETC, I've always seen us as people who can indirectly support our, you know, first three goals of prevention, improving health-related outcomes, and reducing disparities. A lot of our projects and our training are aimed at providing information and knowledge to agencies and sites who are providing the services that prevent new infections, that improve these outcomes, that reduce these disparities. But I've always, as an AETC person, been drawn to our goal four, which is to achieve an integrated and coordinated effort, right? That really addresses our HIV epidemic among all of our partners and our stakeholders, something that is more connected. Um, so I was really happy when I got a phone call about a year ago uh, from a colleague, uh, a new AETC member named Raina, who said, hey, person who I heard does this, what are you doing? And I'm new here. Can you tell me how you're doing? And maybe I'll do that. And I said, sure, I'll download my stuff to you. I hope it's valuable. I had no idea uh, by handing off what little material I thought I was given uh, that my one of our colleagues uh, who we brought with us today uh, was really going to take that material and make it their own and kind of implement a project that I would say is like in the spirit of lead, but just really reflects what happens when uh, people who do good work talk to other people who do good work and share ideas. Uh, you can integrate that good work into your own. And I would say through my interactions over the last year with Raina, I have learned more than I have in the past 10 years about my own process just by having 
another one of my colleagues who understands the work that we're doing and is as committed to doing a good job as I think uh, Susan and I were when we laid out the model. So what I'd like to do now uh, is bring into the conversation our colleague, Reina. Uh, we are so happy to have you here today. Uh, what we've done is laid out three questions for Reina that we thought might uh, help bring this program not only a little bit more alive, uh, but kind of explain some value. Because when you invent something right, we're like parents, we always love our children. We always think they're the greatest thing in the whole wide world. But if you really wanna know how great someone's kids are, right, ask their best friends, right? <laughs> so to this table, we are bringing our best friend colleague. So Reina, uh, first of all, you know, introduce yourself, let us know a little bit more about you. And then if you wanna launch into our first question about how you've utilized our virtual coach training. So my name is Raina Appenzeller, and I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a new full-time practice transformation lead for the Oregon AETC. And since August, it's been my job to work with FQHCs across Oregon and Southwest Washington on quality improvement and systems change. I primarily focus on improving access along the HIV care continuum for Black, Latinx, and Indigenous populations, because if we're going to end HIV, we have to better address the needs of key populations that are disproportionately experiencing higher barriers. So I use the training for onboarding and determining how to build a replicable system or coaching for systems change. And I utilize the virtual training to understand my role, organize my projects, create detailed plans, document progress towards project goals, and create a timeline that commiserates with my deliverables. So generally speaking, my PT plan is 12 months and it's a five step approach. So step one is to get to know the clinic as soon as possible by conducting a SWOT, which includes identifying barriers to care. Uh, two is to choose an area of focus that's important to my champions and begin to build the relationship to keep motivation high. And we draft those project aim statements and goals together. Uh, three is to conduct research on HRSA funded spins models and really connect with AETCs to discover and also communicate, you know, like what are the emerging strategies that that exist across AETCs and then replicate that. But all of that has to be in line with the champion's outcome of interest. And also we need as an AETC to be able to identify uh, where there are opportunities to provide education and training to meet the clinic's needs. Uh, step four is to facilitate discussion and documentation of the progress around planning and implementation of interventions. I do the analysis on the back end as a neutral convener because obviously my stakeholders in clinic can't do that on their own. But it also helps me make sure we're all on the same page. And then the last step of my process really is to identify tools to replicate and sustain the system of change. So I formally, I'm formally trained to mine for information, but I really needed a framework, framework to ground my work in. And the virtual training gave me a solid replicable approach. It also helped me explain to my stakeholders the models I follow for PT, the tools I use for PT, including SPINs, and the engagement strategies, um, which include linking FQHCs to Ryan White systems as part of promoting a sustainable system of care. And after a lot of discussion with my Oregon team, we've come to the conclusion that this will be especially important for folks given our mostly rural landscape. We don't receive EHE funding, so we've been creative in working across AETCs for learning in real time to prevent that delay um, of information for patients. So a, a couple of things that made the training really amazing, an amazing resource for me is I got to complete the training on my own time, at my own pace, and I had the opportunity to receive feedback from experienced coaches to ensure that I was actually applying the QI tools correctly. And this really complemented the training that I received from my incredible team and my incredible program manager in Oregon. The virtual training was timely in, the, in that the COVID-19 pandemic contributed to high staff turnover at my clinics, which affected staffing capacity, 
priorities and collaboration and having an approach to PT really helped me build help build my confidence as a coach and also to create change within my FQHCs at a time of need. It also helped build confidence among my champions and colleagues. So upon request, I've shared relevant parts of my training with regional partners looking for new approaches to coaching. And I've recommended the virtual training to other coaches in my region and my regional office actually selected components of the training for our PT summit, which Adam could highlight um, and train those coaches. So then that put me in a position where I could actually um, work with coaches in my region and discuss my projects uh, instead of bugging the folks over at the Northeastern and Caribbean AETC. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I was like, she got more. Oh my goodness. So <laughs> it sounds like one, uh, you know, virtual training, good, right? And I really appreciate that you talked about being able to do it on your own time. I think that really speaks a lot to the constraints of our environment, which is they're busier than we are and we feel pretty busy. So, um, so kind of picking it apart a little bit, you know, we in the virtual training talked all about a lot of methods, right? Ones that I can say on our side of the, the pond here, you know, the other part of the side of the country that we found were more helpful and other ones that I think in the future we might let go of. So I'm just curious from your perspective, what methods did you find most useful in your practice transformation work? So I use the SWOT to get to know my clinics, process maps to determine my how my stakeholders are working together and which changes they want across systems to better coordinate care along the HIV care continuum. And I use the PDSA tracker to document intervention strategies and smaller change ideas to try later. My stakeholders are FQHCs, the County Health Department, the State Health Department, and case management through a CBO. So yeah, the SWOT, process mapping, PDSA tracker, and maintaining a change log are the main tools I use to help gain a good understanding about the culture of my clinics and how stakeholders are working together and where stakeholders want to make changes to improve health outcomes for those facing high, the highest barriers. My champions know their strengths, but they don't always know their weakness, where their weaknesses can be opportunities. So a really good SWAT puts me in a position to identify my champions' priorities, goals, opportunities, draft an aim statement, and keep our projects well-focused. It also allows me to identify these smaller components, these smaller system changes that may need to occur in order for a bigger change. Through the SWAT, I really learned my, my clinic's goals. I would say clinic two, it's to increase PrEP intake. For both clinics, it's to provide better gender affirming care. And then really focusing on clinic one and rapid starts, re-engaging patients lost to care and getting newly diagnosed and previously lost to care patients on immediate art therapy um, has been big. And through process mapping, we work together to identify barriers to the gaps to service and needs for patient experience, uh, needs to improve patient experience. So process mapping, I can't stress this enough, has been a really essential component of creating a system of change within my clinic. Um, and this is because it's an interactive process where all participating stakeholders get to discuss their strengths, introduce change ideas, and to ideas to improve coordinated care. And then they get to decide whether to implement a change. We also hold TA sessions to support process mapping as a systems intervention. And many, many ideas from our TA sessions become trackable PDSA cycles. Some are small, others are really ambitious, and my stakeholders through process mapping have become more confident in identifying opportunities for change, contemplating change ideas as a group, implementing changes with feedback. And if they agree it's a good idea, we go ahead and try it. And if they don't, we shelf the idea and reintroduce it at a later date, or maybe never. They get to decide. So many changes and change ideas have been made in a very short period of time for me, and or for us, I should say, and I track them all in the change log, which was part of the training. And for one clinic, I've logged over 200, but then I consolidated them into groups, a group of 78. 
And so for these, I identified six priorities and plugged them into my PDSA tracker. And that's really our plan for the upcoming year. We won't run all six PDSAs at one time, but we've at least contemplated them and documented the priorities. The ones we've prioritized are the most important to stakeholders and align really well with SPIN's projects like Rapid Starts and Peer Integration. Holy moly, there are people all over the country who are like 278. They, that's amazing, Rena. You know, I think it really speaks to the power of having someone who's paying attention to all the ideas, right? Our clinics and our organizations have great ideas and many of them fall on the floor or stay on the wall. And, you know, just having someone in the room whose eyes are attuned, like you were saying, you're trained to mine for information. It's like when you have folks who have that, those lenses on, there's a lot of stuff that is possible inside our organization. So let me ask you one last question here. And this is, you know, when I travel around the country and talk to other AATCs, I hear it from a lot of people, just tell me what to do, right? Like what are the steps, right? Give, give me the plan. And, you know, we didn't really get a plan as the AATCs. They just kind of said, you know, here's the scope and kind of this is what we expect. And we were kind of left to develop our own sort of methods uh, to go about this. So my question to you, I know you're, you know, relatively new to the AATC, but since you adapted, right, this methodology and kind of like deployed it in your own environment, how have you seen your work change, if at all? So process mapping is a systems change intervention that we've implemented to provide stakeholders with a deeper understanding of each other's organization's processes, their goals, and their efforts. And it's been an engaging process that's really accelerated relationship building and change across systems. Each map that I've created with stakeholders tells the story of how systems currently work. And updated maps reflect those reflect changes to those systems. So I document the change processes and outcomes for stakeholders to use for onboarding and also to show the incredible work that they've done. And honestly, I feel like the training helped me crack the code on getting stakeholders to engage in QI work with me in a way that feels really rewarding. I consistently receive positive feedback about how process mapping has helped stakeholders gain a better understanding around how to improve coordinated care services. And I have many maps <laughs> that have led to the creation of new workflows, practices, and shifts in mindset. I also have a short list of requests from stakeholders to map additional processes that aren't well understood. And I feel really honored that my clinic stakeholders want to continue mapping existing systems to promote mutual understanding and systems change. So the plan is, now that we have these maps, we plan to revisit and update these maps quarterly to determine whether the change ideas and the changes are actually resulting in improvements. And like I said, stakeholders are, are enthusiastically requesting more mapping to understand their workflows. But just some examples, we've gotten requests for mapping, tracking medication adherence, care coordination, navigation efforts, and TA sessions are underway to fulfill these requests. Lastly, I just want to share some positive feedback from my PT sites and stakeholders. Do we have time for that? Okay, I'm going to do it. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> So a provider from I'll call it Clinic One um, said it was really helpful being forced to think about our process and assessing the process was good. And comparing and comparing ours to the stakeholders made it a lot clearer to see where things aren't going well and the benefits of involving others to get patients the care they need. Also, we have a system to get patients in rapidly and do rapid starts for HIV. It's been really satisfying and a product of the communication trees we built. From the medical director uh, from Clinic One, it's been really good to meet and see everyone's process. And then from the county health department, where Clinic One, or I should say Clinic One's uh, county health department, says, I like that we're being realistic about our actual process, not our, idea, our ideal pr procedure. Uh, it made me realize how disconnected we were with our community providers. Super helpful, and it made us clarify exact points, point people. And then the last comment um, from the county health department, we established a decent process to communicate 
between case management and the clinic about patients lost to care. And there's just a couple more uh, from our a CBO with the clinic that provides case management to the clinic. Really helpful to see all the different moving pieces and draw it all together. We improved basic communication with the HIV clinic. The workflow Raina made from the last meeting was really helpful. Also loving our group quarterly meetings to talk about clients, patients as well. This is a great way to make sure we're all on the same page and get face time between teams. And then from the State Department of Health, uh, mapping has been helpful in creating more routine communications with the CBO and the FQHCs. That is amazing. I think it's probably been an eternity since I've heard anyone say, I love that quarterly meeting. And so I think, you know, that really speaks to, I think, not only, Raina, the amazing amount of knowledge and expertise that you have not only brought when you walked in the door, but that you've built over the last year. It's been a real honor and privilege to observe from afar, like you sort of doing this work and in many ways, running right past us here in the Northeast Caribbean. So now you've given us something to shoot for and to try uh, and, and up our game with these 200, you know, change ideas that you're bringing to the table. Um, it's been really great, you know, and I think it speaks a lot to, in particular, uh, the need for transparency in healthcare and how critical it is that people have a shared understanding of what's going on. Sometimes the most innovative thing that we could do is to simply do what we are already doing, but just do it well right and do it efficiently uh, and there doesn't take a lot of innovation you right a lot of people to do that it just takes dedicated people who pay attention to the process and have the right way to see it um, so thank you Raina for coming as uh, Susan any last thoughts before we kick it over to a discussion with our audience no just that it's completely refreshing to see that this this package of trainings and the model is moving forward and spreading and i appreciate all your work and yes the challenge is on the northeast aids education center is ready to move forward and uh, try to try to reach the, the 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 progress that you've made already so it's great to see thanks Great. Well, I think at this point, what we'll do is uh, end this portion uh, of our discussion and then begin the live portion uh, with any questions or comments from the audience. Thank you all for joining us. So thank you. So um, we want to take this time to thank our presenters for addressing this timely and interesting topic and providing concepts of virtual training for practice transformation. So thank you all for that. Um, at this time, I don't see any questions in the chat box, uh, but are there any other um, comments that you all wanna share with the audience? Just that if folks are interested in any of the tools or the trainings that we talked about, we did upload things to YouTube, so they are pretty accessible. Uh, so feel free to reach out. I know we put our email addresses there in the chat room. Um, any of the tools that we discussed, uh, even if we didn't show a picture of them, we're happy to share it with people. Uh, we learned a lot by our mentors sharing things with us, so we're happy uh, to give out what we have. Yeah, I'll just echo. Uh... We use a virtual tool that Adam introduced me to, Miro. Uh, it's a virtual white, infinite whiteboard. And so if you do have questions, please do reach out because we have really easy ways of sharing that information and showing you the work that we've done. I would just highlight the process mapping um, plug that Raina made. Um, and, I, and I know Adam is also passionate about that. Um, but truly using it as an intervention to bring your teams together and to really look at your systems is a very powerful tool. And we welcome sort of any requests to learn more about that. So I do see one question in the chat box stating, uh, through what entity can one become practice uh, facilitation certified? So, you know, I'd have to check the landscape. We actually did ours about eight years ago, and there was one program on the East Coast that was run by University of Buffalo, um, and then there, I believe there was one on the West Coast that was run out of 
maybe UCSF. Uh, they were associated with AHRQ and through funding there. So um, I'd have to look it up. I'm not, I'm not sure uh, who's doing it right now, but those were the two places that I knew of when we started our process. Okay, well, we have about five minutes left in the session. So I just wanna thank everyone for your particip participation today. Um, as part of the HIV AIDS Bureau's efforts to provide you with timely topics and interesting speakers, we appreciate you filling out the session evaluations at the end of each session. If you are seeking continuing education credits, please complete the additional evaluation for credit. To access these evalu evaluations, please return to the session page within the platform and click on the blue evaluation links. And I wanna thank everybody again for joining.